All right, thanks, Aaron. Yeah, and thanks for having me again. This is a, a third time speaking at the conservation workshop this year. And so a little outline on, uh, this is the outline that was put up for the uh, presentation. Uh, this talk will provide you all with an overview of the various herbicide applications and uh, sprayers that are currently available. And we're gonna cover the safety uh, pros and cons of some of these sprayer types and best practices when applying the herbicides. And then um, hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a better understanding of the ways invasive species can be safely managed at home and uh, also while volunteering. And so I've surrounded this, uh, I've outlined the outline with all sorts of uh, the in invasive plants from Southern Illinois, we have Japanese hops and bush honeysuckle, chaff flower, teasel, microstegium, garlic mustard, autumn olive, there's lots of them. And so uh, as an outline, we're gonna cover herbicide applications. So the different types of herbicide applications, um, sprayer types, the sprayers pros and cons. So we'll actually compare um, some of the best ways and best applications for these uh, different sprayers. Best management practices, um, those BMPs, and how to approach an infestation um, so I've used this list before called the top 10. So it's the top 10, um, you just found an infestation or you're going to go and start treating an infestation, how to go about doing that. How to be safe with all your practices and working at home and volunteering. And then uh, we'll finish up with some invasive species resources and I'll answer some questions. Some background on uh, my job in the River River Cooperative Weed Management Area. Uh, this was first established in 2006 and since then uh, has had a full-time project coordinator. This is a formalized partnership between 13 federal and state agencies, uh, not-for-profit not or organizations and universities, um, and all in uh, the goal of uh, eradicating or uh, managing uh, invasive species. And all these projects are managed under the Shawnee Resource Conservation and Development which is a not-for-profit organization. And the objectives of the Cooperative Weed Management, education and awareness, uh, organization and capacity building, coordinated control efforts, and then research and applied methods. So um, we're working on uh, education right now and awareness. And there are some publications too. Um, the Management of Invasive Plants of Southern Illinois is one of them. And that can be found at the, on the River to River website. And I'll have that link um, at the end here. So this is where we're located and there are other CWMAs um, kind of scattered throughout the country too. Um, this is what ours looks like down here in Southern Illinois. And this uh, encompasses the Southern 11 counties in Illinois. And you can see all the other ones um, just across the Great Lakes and all that. So here we are. And for those of you um, that are unaware of uh, what invasive species are, just a few quick slides on a, um, a brief overview. These are um, plants and animals that are out of place and out of balance. They've come here with some sort of competitive advantage. And they don't have any natural checks. Um, they can come in many taxa too. So, you know, it's not just plants, although we're going to be talking about plants today. Uh, there's also insects and um, fungal pathogens and uh, fish and animals too. Um, and there's many theories about um, how they are able to spread. Um, and this, this, I just want to mention that this poor bus here, this was en route to school as the kudzu took it over. These are some of the uh, stages of infestation. Um, so from arrival to spread and the uh, thresholds that are passed along the way. And so we start with arrival and then it uh, establishes, colonizes, naturalizes, and spreads. And each one of these has a uh, barrier that uh, will overcome along the way. So uh, these would be the hypotheses that would be supporting that. We have the uh, empty niche, so the space was open already. Uh, the enemy release, uh, they had no more natural enemies once they got there. They may be armed with some sort of a uh, allelopathy or the novel weapon. And then over time, actually a feedback occurs where um, the soil and uh, uh, 
animals that are eating it, them actually uh, prime the soil for them to continue to spread. And so that was just a brief overview of invasives. And now we'll get into um, how to manage invasive species. That's the focus of this presentation. So we have the on the ground management of invasives and we have chemical control. That's the focus of this talk today um, where we have foliar cut stump and basal bark treatment. There is, there are also um, mechanical and prescribed fire. Also, um, you know, in the classroom and in the office, this is another tool used to manage invasive species. You know, it's a community education, um, like what we're doing now, just growing awareness of invasive species, uh, cross cross boundary cooperation. So, going from um, all the, the agencies and private uh, organizations working together to manage invasive species, and then also if you're a landowner, getting into a forest forest management plan. So working with uh, your state foresters and um, talking to them about getting a, a management plan where you have um, goals and objectives to meet to, to make your forests healthier. And so these are the types of uh, herbicide applications that we'll be covering today. We have a foliar application. This is spraying the leaves of actively growing plants with a low concentration of herbicide. Uh, it's usually about like 2% or so. Cut stump. This is cutting a tree or shrub low to the ground and applying an herbicide to the cambium. And that cambium layer, that's the outer layer of a stump with a higher concentration of herbicide. So you're going to be using a little bit higher concentration than you would with the foliar. Um, it's usually anywhere from 16 to 20% um, with one herbicide and then up 50% using um, you know, water base. And basal bark applications. So this is not cutting the plant, uh, um, and uh, instead just applying herbicide with a higher concentration and an oil carrier to the outer parts of a tree or shrub. So this would be uh, plants that um, don't take well to being cut, not usually a root sucker. And like I said, there are mechanical and cultural practices to control invasive species. This is focused on situations where chemical treatments are being used. So get into it, uh, foliar treatments. So this is, uh, I like this, uh, this milk carton. This is a really uh, clever too. I like that to uh, avoid some sort of collateral damage too. And uh, this is targeting individual plants or clumps, um, doing some uh, spot treatments is what it's called. So if you have a lot of invasives in one spot, um, you'll target them. This really helps to uh, reduce non-target effects. And it's typically done with a low solution, uh, you know, about one to 5% um, mix of uh, herbicide. And timing, you want these to be actively growing. So you don't want them to be um, senescing. We're kind of getting out of the uh, foliar treatment season right now, um, since plants are starting to senesce and uh, pull out of those nutrients back in. So you want them to be uh, actively growing when you're doing a foliar treatment. When you're spraying, uh, when you, you when you are uh, doing this, um, you're going to th thoroughly wet all the leaves to the point of runoff, not beyond um, runoff. You don't want it to be dripping all over, but um, you do want to make sure that you have um, most or all of the leaves covered. And before you go out, you really want to make sure that you have an idea of what the weather is going to look like. Uh, a lot of labels have this rain safe time, but general rule of thumb, if it's going to be raining anytime soon, just don't go out and spray and just wait until it's going to be uh, you know, clear weather for a few days or so, just so you uh, are ensuring that you're going to have a really uh, effective treatment. But there are rain safe times on the label and that'll let you know um, how long of a period before the next rain you'll have. when you're doing your foliar treatments too, uh, be conscious of the wind and uh, where you're standing. And then also remember what it was that you last sprayed in the tank. So, um, you know, maybe you're switching uh, chemicals back and forth um, in the tank that you were using and one was selective for um, a, a 
broadly specific and you're now you're spraying with grass specific and just about back and forth just be conscious and make sure you, that you have your tanks uh, properly clean so there's not residual left behind and uh, thanks to Caleb Grantham for this photo this is a, a photo of the strike team spraying kudzu um, situation where you really want to be conscious of the uh, the wind and where you're standing um, when you're managing kudzu infestations. And so after you spray it, uh, you're going to, you know, a few weeks later, you're going to start seeing some yellowing of the leaves and they're going to start to look like they're, um, they're starting to get sick. And then you show back up a few weeks later and uh, they will have uh, completely taken on the herbicide and you know that you have a successful treatment and you'll come back. Um, sometimes there's a like some root suckering, um, something like that that comes from after that. But uh, that's you usually want to do follow up treatments when you come back out. So um, now moving on. So we've covered uh, foliar treatments. Now we're going to cover uh, chemical treatments of uh, cut stump and basil bark. Um, so this has really little. Uh, non-target effects uh, since you're actually cutting a tree out of the way and then applying to that that stump or you're applying it to the standing uh, um, um, stump too. So uh, there's a higher solution 15 to 50 percent. Um, it depends on what you're using too. So say you are using uh, a broadly specific like garlon or triclopyr. Um, this will be usually in the 15 to 20% range with an oil carrier. Uh, if you're going with a glyphosate, this will be with a 50% uh, mix with water. Um, the limitation there being uh, freezing temperatures with water. So limited by the weather too sometimes. Timing for this, this is, uh, this is a general generalization between cut stump and basil bark and we'll go into each one a little bit more, but uh, uh, anytime but spring and then during leaf out is really less of it's not really effective because there's so much um, sap and um, new growth coming up from uh, from the ground for spring so your, your treatment might be not, not very effective this can be pretty labor intensive too since you are going out there with a saw you're cutting everything um, and you could miss applications too this could be a very difficult to uh, get all those little stems out of the way. Um, and so might be a better uh, candidate for a foliar application instead when, uh, when, it's, uh, when the leaves come back. Now just focusing on cut stump alone. Uh, after cutting down the stem, um, immediately treat the surface with herbicide. Um, <clears throat> you'll have much, uh, much more effective treatment if it's really soon uh, after the cut. And for smaller stems, you can just treat the entire surface. And for larger stems, you can treat that outer uh, cambial layer like I was talking about. And that cambial layer is that layer that's actually going to be moving the nutrients or, or in this case, the chemical uh, herbicide into the roots. And this is a good system too, uh, how we got it going right here. Um, got the man, the myth, the legend, Chris Evans working the weed whacker right there. And um, so we have him got to cut it down. Then he's followed by this guy here who is going to spray the stumps. And so that's a pretty good system uh, to go about going into the woods and treating some uh, woody invasive species. Now here's some of the tools that you can use while you're going out and doing cut stump treatments. And the variant size, so the uh, weed whacker, that's what we were just, that's what we just saw here. This is personally, uh, I really think this is a, one of the most effective ways to go about it. Um, you're away from the blade. Um, it, it, it's surprising the size of the diameter of the, um, uh, of the bushes that you can cut down with this and uh, it's fast. It, it really is fast. So that's good. It's uh, I, I you can do it with a chainsaw too, but after a while your uh, legs and back might start being kind of tired. 
backpack sprayer, um, always a good go-to. Um, got the quartz sprayer, the silky saw, and uh, yeah, these are really good too. They're really handy. All right, so that was what pet stump looks like. Now here's what basil bark looks like. Um, this is spraying trees that um, usually don't take too well to uh, getting cut. So they might root sucker. Um, and so that's why you would be wanting to do this. And see how this is being sprayed not all the way down one side. And you want to do it about 12 to 20 inches above the ground all the way down to the base. Make sure you get up and down all around. And this barbershop uh, sign, I put that in there because if you do have smaller stems, there's a little trick you can do where you hold the stem, you, you hold the sprayer nozzle just against the side of the smaller stem and it'll actually barber around it and um, get you that all around coverage that you're that you're wanting if you do end up wanting to do it like that. And so um, this is another um, reference here too. Uh, this is on the River River website. So that's rtrcwma.org. And this is a quick, quick reference guide for mixing herbicides. It gives you the uh, amount of number of ounces that you would want to put in there all the way up to 20%. And so that's on the website there. And there's quite a few other resources too. I did through it. I threw in just a few mechanical treatments uh, just so you, you know what things look like. Um, Cause you know, if the option's there to do a mechanical treatment, go for it. And um, you got Polar Bear and a Weed Wrench. These are the two main brands really. Um, you can go about using um, mechanical treatments. And this is just using leverage and a clamp in the front there that uh, can pull out pretty decent sized bushes and shrubs too. So if you have a lighter infestation, you can go work pretty quickly with that. They're kind of heavy to lug around the woods with you all day, but um, you know, it's not, it's not really that bad. And, you know, just using your hands too, um, you know, it's never, never hard to, if you got a smaller uh, spot, just go ahead and uh, dig it up, weed whack it, pull it up with your hands. Nothing wrong with that. Okay, so now getting into, um, we've, we've kind of covered the types of uh, applications that we can that we can have out there. Um, so now we're going to talk about the types of sprayers that will uh, apply those those uh, the foliar and the cut stump treatments. So you're going to want to scale your sprayer and the capacity to the size of the job that you're working on, and also to what you can physically handle, because some of these are really heavy uh, and um, you end up walking around in the woods with um, many pounds on your back or uh, on your arms too. So uh, yeah, some of them can be pretty difficult to navigate. And so I've broken this down, um, each one of these sprayer and tank options into three, three things. So we have capacity, uh, the best applications, and then any adjustments and calibrations that you might want to do um, either while you're doing your treatments, keeping an eye on how things are going or uh, just beforehand but hold up, stop everything. Before we even go out, we do wanna make sure that, um, check your O-rings, check your seals, check your O-rings. This is uh, all really important stuff. So um, rings, they're all over the place on these, on these uh, um, tanks and sprayers. And they also are susceptible to chemical and UV damage too. Um, so the bark oil and the, the chemicals that we use, uh, they actually do over time kind of corrode the hosing and the O-rings, um, they kind of make them brittle, more, uh, more able to crack. And, uh, you really want to be uh, conscious of that throughout the, throughout the season, uh, you know, especially after you, you get it back working on it for the first time of the year. Um, and so what you want to do is uh, you want to do some test runs with water before you mix in uh, your chemicals. This can really save you some cleaning. Um, you know, after you, once you got the chemical in there and it, you find out you have a leak, it's it's way, it's, it's just a mess really. 
And um, so some other parts you want to keep handy too. Hose clamps, screwdrivers, plumber's tape. Just go ahead and buy a pack of these O-rings right off the bat um, because that's those are going to be the parts that you're going to be replacing anyway. And what we have, um, we're going to go over uh, the quart sprayer and uh, barrel sprayer, backpack and pump. And I also put a, a gas powered um, pump sprayer in there too. So we have the chemical safe quart bottle. This is a capacity of one to two quarts. That's usually what they're, uh, you know, they go up to about two quarts. And uh, best application for this would be cut stump. This can last surprisingly long out there while you're doing cut stump treatments since you don't really use that much chemical on the stumps. Um, and put an arrow here down to the chemically resistant sprayer. Yeah, you, you do want it to uh, say somewhere that it is chemical safe. You know, they have, there's all sorts of sprayers and some of them are really not, not made for this type of work. And any adjustments and calibrations, there is a front spray nozzle where you can uh, do a little bit of uh, minor adjustments, but nothing really serious. And then uh, with the pressure sprayer, you can adjust some pressure control, but not uh, really that much um, either. It runs out of pressure pretty quick. All right, moving on to uh, handheld sprayers. Capacity is one to three gallons. Uh, some of the best applications for this would be spot spraying, uh, basil and cut stump. You saw that in those photos um, with the cut stump treatments. This, uh, this is a really good one because um, you can set this down and actually help uh, move this out of the way too. So it's not on your back the whole time. And Areas that are incredibly far hiking, so you are going to be carrying this now um, with your arms. So you know, remember, three gallons is 24 pounds. It's still going to start adding up over time if you're hiking out to a spot. Um, and also remember too, just because it's the capacity of something doesn't mean you need to fill it all the way to that level. You know, uh, it doesn't need to be all the way filled up. Adjustments and calibrations for this uh, pressure and nozzle. So the nozzle, uh, you can twist and work on um, for a fan or a straight stream. And then uh, pressure release on the side here. So this is a pressure release right here where you can um, you know, release if it's coming out too fast or something like that, you can you know, work to alleviate that. And so this top handle here is where you're going to pump. And uh, it also locks in place. So it's kind of a twist uh, lock. There's an O-ring right on the top there, and the handle is just uh, got quite a few O-rings on that too. How uh, the backpack break capacity? These go uh, so from three to five uh, gallons. I've seen them sold all the way up to five gallons, which that's forty pounds on your back. You can uh, it's like doing a fire pack test. So. Uh, Best application for this would be spot and broadcast spraying, um, and then also doing basil and cut stumps. So this is it's the jack of all trades. It can really do it all. Um, as I said, though, be conscious of the uh, the uh, corrosion or uh, dry rotting of some hosing and parts that if you're using uh, like oil and things like oil carriers in in the sprayer. So just like the um, barrel uh, sprayer, the adjustments and calibrations are pressure and the nozzle. So the pressure uh, release is just going to be the hand trigger there. Um, you really don't want to uh, release pressure by opening the tops of these or anything like that because you can end up getting like sprayed in the face and thing. And so um, really just the handle would be a good way. And the side lever is the, um, is the pump. And you can see here, it's left and right ready. So you can switch this over to the other side and, um, you know, if you're left or right-handed. Okay, so the slip-on tank with a pump, and this is, uh, this is a slip-on tank with an electric pump. So the capacity of these, this goes up to uh, 25 to 50 gallons. Uh, the best evidence for this would be foliar. Um, you don't really want to want to run a lot of oil or anything like that through these. Uh, this, this would be foliar treatments. 
uh, doing trail work and field edges, um, any of the adjustments and calibrations for this. So a uh, power source for this is going to be wired to your um, the battery of your UTV or ATV and keeps uh, constant pressure. So it's just going to it's going to have a, uh, a you know kind of a generalized output where it can shoot about uh, up to about 20 feet, fit maybe 15 feet or so. Um, that's what it looked like they were rated for. So uh, you see here where on a, they put a couple boards underneath it for stability and then basically just strap it down. You can ratchet strap it down to the back of um, you know whatever it is you're moving around on. So um, pretty good tool for getting some some nice trail work done and things like that. And then uh, kind of amping it up a little bit um, you know, with power on your pump um, would be going on. This is as, as far um, as we're going to go um, with this today is um, to the gas powered large pump here. Um, but it needs to go up to 52, you know, go up to 100 gallons. You can go as large a tank as you want as long as you can drag it around. Um, but really kind of maxing it out with that 50 gallons is uh, what uh, UTVs and ATVs can really handle. Um, best applications for this would be similar to the, uh, the electric pump where you have uh, foliar treatments on trail work and, and field edges. The power source for this is gonna be gas. So it's a gas powered motor and you have adjusted pressure control now. So you can really um, adjust for what you're working on. You can start doing uh, higher vines and trees. And if you have really uh, extensive populations that uh, you need more hosing for, you'll have the power to get the hose um, to the right spots too, the, the pressure. And uh, many times these are diaphragm pumps, not all of them. Um, and um, the ones I've worked with personally have been diaphragm pumps. And uh, you're gonna wanna make sure that you also have those because um, those do go bad too. Uh, they're like little uh, um, membranes, little rubber membranes that um, you can replace. And you know when you need to replace them because you end up with uh, um, water in your, uh, in your pump oil. So um, I've made this little comparison chart here now. So we have sprayer pros and cons. And uh, I just listed the sprayers that we just talked about and uh, gave it a pro and a con. And then uh, this is the best application from how I covered this too. So, um, you know, we can go over each one of them too. So the quartz sprayer, lightweight, reliable. It's easy to maintain, easy to navigate rough terrain with. However, it's limited by size. So uh, if, if the infestation is large, um, they don't all spray upside down, meaning that you're gonna probably run out a few times and um, be back and forth. Um, so cut stump is a really good application for those though. The handheld sprayer, well, a pro, you can set this down and help swamp. Uh, can be difficult for your arms though. And there is some maintenance with those O-rings and uh, making sure that the hoses and everything aren't leaking or anything. Spot spraying, basil, and cut stump for this. Uh, backpack sprayer, pretty similar to the handheld sprayer, except it's uh, the weight on your back instead. And <laughs> funny, the pro is also the con. So uh, puts weight on your back. And the con is that it puts weight on your back. Uh, <laughs> Also maintenance for this too, um, similar to the handheld sprayer. They're really similar. A slip on tank with the pump uh, can carry large amounts of mixed solution, but you're limited to um, the, the, the pressure that you, you're given with that. So spot spraying, some broadcast spraying, but not um, mostly just spot spraying on trails. Um, you can carry, uh, so this, uh, the, this last one here, the, the slip on tank with the uh, the pump with this gas powered. There's a little bit more maintenance um, for this, the pump oil and the diaphragm pump and all that. Um, but you can carry large amounts of liquid uh, too. So um, I just thought that would be a helpful resource. Uh, now going into this, um, this question comes up a lot. It's like, when is the, uh, when is the best time to get rid of it or start working on a, a, a infestation? And so this, this term phenology comes up. So this is the study of the cyclic and seasonal natural phenomena, especially in the relation to climate and uh, plant and animal life. 
So we're talking about plants here and we have this nice phenology chart. And so we'll go over what, um, here's, a, here's a phenology chart for treatments on uh, bush honeysuckle and your honeysuckle. And then we have this color coding, so purple and green. So we look here, purple, green, that's cut stump. So it looks like cut stump is good from August through February. And so the idea being that a lot of these nutrients, now the plants are senescing, things are going underground. And so we're gonna want that chemical to go with it. And um, notice here, so starting in March, April, May, you don't really wanna to do too much. And the reason being, uh, like I had said before, a lot of nutrients coming back up. And so um, now they'll come back up, they're gonna grow their leaves. And so now we're gonna start into the foliar treatments. That's June. So leaves will be early June, like most things, it's uh, gonna be fully leafed out. And so you can start with that 2% glyphosate mix right here. And so that's how you would read uh, for each one of these species, this is color coded with that key right there. That's how you would go about doing that. And now here we are at the uh, top 10, how to approach an infestation. And we're gonna go each over each one of these um, uh, steps basically. So strategize, learn how to uh, identify, avoid, recognize, respond, minimize disturbance, maintain desirable species, avoid working in areas with invasives, uh, conduct activities for invasives last, and remove all soil. So we're gonna go over each one of these now. You just found an infestation and you're wanting to uh, um, prioritize how to go about it. And you have two locations right here. You have a satellite population and a large infestation right here. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is focus on these, uh, priority, these, these are priority spots now because um, it's an outlier and you're, you can tackle that first and then work on the larger infestation, start at the edge and work inward. And so that's a generalization of how to approach um, kind of a, an infestation that is sending out satellite populations. These would be like propagules coming out and spreading uh, further. So you'd wanna tackle that one first. I almost think that this one should be, this actually should go, this should be the first step. You wanna actually know what you got, um, but definitely learn to identify invasive species. Um, we do have the resources online, uh, Invasive Plants of Southern Illinois. I actually just renewed this too. So we just updated this with new species. Uh, so there will be a new um, PDF on the website. But yeah, learn to identify the invasive species in your area. Um, and we have, we have the resources available. Avoid any unintentional introduction and spread um, when you're out and bring a brush with you or put it in your car. And if you're on a um, trail where you see a boot brush station, uh, use it. And uh, that, that really helps to uh, kind of alleviate some of the pressures on our natural areas too. And um, you know, uh, air, uh, air pressure too, um, if you get back home and you wanna spray your boots down. It's a, it's a good thing too. If you're doing work on your property um, and uh, you have invasive species, if you're doing any management, uh, recognize what are some of the uh, responses of invasive species to some of those things. So what's gonna happen to this bush honeysuckle if you don't treat it after you just cut it? It's gonna re-sprout. Uh, what's gonna happen to um, some of your property if you don't uh, treat some stilt grass before you burn it? It's gonna come back stronger. And so knowing the, the responses of these invasives is a really, a, it's a really good thing. Respond early. These new and in, in, invasive species, these new uh, outbreaks, that's called EDRR, it's early detection and rapid response. And so we have this invasion curve here. This is the amount infested and time. So you can see over time, the amount infested goes up right here, right on detection. This is when prevention and eradication is really, really simple. It might just be a few populations that you need to control. 
And you can see as you move up, where are we? Oops. <laughs> as we move up, uh, public awareness begins when eradication is unlikely. And so we have a, a we have a, a plant right now that's starting to fill in these uh, uh, categories. So it'd be chaff flower. Public awareness is starting right around here right now, and uh, eradication is becoming more and more difficult because it's spreading so fast. And then at the third stage here, you end up really, really focusing on the high quality spots that you know, you're, you're saving what you can in the highest quality spots. So that's um, it's kind of what it looks like. Minimize disturbance during management. Yeah, I'm not clairvoyant, but I do know I, I have a pretty good idea what will happen here. Uh, it's going to look like still grass, still grass city pretty soon. And it looks like these ruts go all the way up the road, all the way up. So that's usually the first thing that comes in, still grass and all sorts of other invasives too. But really want to minimize that disturbance because this is just setting it. You know, you're just basically planting invasive plants when you do things like this. Maintain the, uh, some de desirable species. So, um, you know, when you're out there doing work uh, and uh, you have some good native plants, uh, really work, be careful working around them and uh, really try to uh, nurture them. Those are going to be your, that's your seed source. That's, that's your, uh, that's your competition for your uh, invasive. So you're filling in the gaps that you just created. When you do have invasives on your property or, or you're working and volunteering somewhere, um, just avoid working in areas where uh, invasive species and seeds are present. Um, especially with this, you know, this is um, three different invaders with different seeds. So we have chaff flower here, these little chaffs, uh, and microstegium right in the middle, and then garlic mustard. So all different seeds um, that could be spread, you know, through boots or attached into your clothing um, or your animals too, or your equipment. There's all sorts of different ways that this could happen. Uh, if unavoidable, uh, it, so conduct these activities uh, with the invasives last um, after you've done the uh, work in the uninfested areas. Uh, and this is just to prevent that further spread of uh, seed or propagules too. And finally, thoroughly uh, work to remove all the soil and plant material off the equipment after working. So this is a really nice setup here. I like a lot um, where it's a station with a pump and uh, all the seeds are going to be going underneath there. Um, he's spraying it down. So that's a, it, they're all being captured there. Um, that's pretty nice. And it's free. It looks like, how about that? Those are the top 10. Um, and, and, um, there are other really good practices too. Those, those, those are the ones that are just on the list right now. Um, and now talking about safety, safety with each practice. So every single uh, uh, container of herbicide that you get is gonna have a label with it. And um, if the label gets really um, smeared and um, can't read it that well, you can go online and find it anyway on cdms.net. And um, you really want to read that herbicide label. Um, take care when applying on your water. Make sure that you're using aquatic herbicides too. Um, you know, that's just making sure that you read the, la the label. It's a legal document. And um, so it's, it's, it's all the right information on there. There's just one page of what uh, the label will look like and some of the information that will be on there. Um, you know, the trade name chemical name, the active ingredient, then that EPA registration number, you can type that number in or the trade name into that cdms.net website and it'll give you um, the info about how it's supposed to be used. And of course the safety of volunteers and everyone involved is the mo most important thing when we're doing all, these, um, all this work. So PPE is huge. This is really, really important. And uh, what you want to do is wear uh, all your PPE, limit or contain the spills, uh, reduce exposure as much as possible. So a good pair of tinglys will last you for a long time. It's $15 and they'll last for a couple of years. And 
uh, N95, some nitro gloves, um, cat litter. Just keep a bag of cat litter around just in case you guys spill. Those are all really good things. And then also eye protection all the time. Good, got real good example of PPE right here um, with hat, long sleeve gloves, uh, or long sleeve shirt, gloves, um, eye protection. I'm sure he's wearing boots. Um, yeah, this is this is what what it looks like. And be conscious of where you're working. Um, I, I mentioned the collateral damage in native species. This is what we're, we're trying to protect the native species and limit the pressures. Um, don't store your tanks under pressure. A accidental bumps, and accidentally spray kids, uh, spray animals on accident. Just don't spray, uh, store them under pressure. It can be hard on the seals too. Um, understand the understand the chemical. Um, you're using how it works uh, based on selectivity. Is it uh, grass specific, broadly specific, or non-specific at all? I'd mentioned this already. Um, storing cat litter, extra clothes too, um, in case of emergencies. And then also uh, following these uh, EPA and OSHA standards. Just treat yourself as if you were an employee at your own house and uh, keep yourself to those same standards. Also, uh, there's the epa.gov registration label review, so it can go in greater detail um, at that website. You can look up on the um, Department of Agriculture's website too, how uh, each one of these chemicals, so if you have a chemical um, herbicide and you wanna know what its um, restrictions are um, in Illinois, you can type it in on this website. It's a Illinois um, Department of Agriculture website, and it will give you the restrictions. So I typed in element. There's two of them. There's the element three and four for foliar and uh, cut stump treatments. So uh, both of them came up as general use. And then here's that label review manual too for the EPA for pesticide registration. So just to recap, um, learn to identify some invasives, avoid working in areas with invasives, and use boot brush stations when hiking on trails. And how to get involved, just start, uh, volunteering. We have this uh, FRST program, which is called the Forest Restoration Support Team. And this is a group of uh, um, volunteers that go out to um, each other's properties, they, they join as members and go out to each other's properties and work on invasive uh, species management um, in priority spots on each other's lands. So it's really lightening the lightening the load too. Um, and there's uh, this website here. So um, frstillinois.com. And I do have the website um, link to in here. Uh, but this is what the website looks like and uh, you can learn a lot more about it um, and similar um, so a similar model too is the um, SIPA S Southern Illinois Prescribed Burn Association uh, getting involved with them and they also have a website that's SIPA.org and with uh, the last few minutes I did want to introduce this uh, program that we have um, all together with the CWMA, SIPA, and the uh, Forest Restoration Support Team um, through an LSR grant called Assuring Self-Sufficiency. And the main focus of this is uh, an herbicide and tools for labor trade-off with landowners. So this is a, a two to four week lending program where we'll provide you with uh, uh, the tools and uh, chemical to get the job done on your property yourself. Um, and we definitely would um, also recommend that you became an FRST member and a SIPA member. Um, and so those are the two websites right there too, FRST Illinois and SIPA.org. Here's what it looks like uh, behind the scenes. Um, so we've put on a few uh, um, presentations already focused on the identification and management of uh, invasives. 
uh, and so that's kind of training the crews that are going to be going out and doing the work, uh, which would be the landowners. And uh, here's Jesse. Oh, this is late at night, filling all these court sprayers so we could distribute them out to uh, landowners. Some additional resources. So we've got um, all these different websites here, invasives.org, um, MIPN, that's Midwest Invasive Plant Network.org, wildspotter.org. It's uh, specific, so wildspotter.org is specific to the uh, Southern Illinois region too. Um, you just choose Shawnee Forest. Um, edmaps.org, you can go and report in uh, new infestations that you find. And then um, the River River Cooperative Weed Management Area.org, so this website. And with that, uh, I will take any questions that we have. This is that's what I got. Great, thanks so much, Nick. Um, I'm encourage, encouraging anybody in the audience, if you have questions, to go ahead and put them in the chat box and we'll get to them as many as we can. We have already had a lot of questions come in though. So I'm just gonna go down the list here. Um, can you can you talk about a little bit about a couple of other, uh, there was some chat going on about a couple other application methods, uh, particularly hack and squirt and injection, stem injections. Can you talk about those and how they differ from cut stump or basal bark? Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, with the cut stump, or with, with the well, hack and squirt, sorry, um, that's going around. Um, so you're actually making um, with a hatchet or, or something, uh, a knife or a hatchet or something sharp, cutting around a uh, a tree or a woody uh, plant and um, in, in spraying herbicide into the cut mark that you made. And so um, that is. Uh, yeah, you know, an effective way to go about it too. Um, and uh, it's the diameter of the tree it determines the amount of uh, cuts that you're actually going to want to make on the sides of it too. So um, that yeah, that's that's that, and that's how that differs from a cut stump. And then um, the stem injection treatments. I actually uh, have not done stem injections. I do know that um, with uh, not weed and some plants that have hollow stems though um th that's uh, an effective way to go about um managing them so okay great um similar question somebody talked about is there a question that you can use gloves to apply herbicide and i think what they're talking about is where you put a cotton glove over a nitrile glove and then you can be very selective at wicking for foliar application yes yeah yeah so that's that's another way um I've, people do that with like uh, Lespedeza is a common one that they do that with where you can just run your hand up it um, after it's been soaked in um, some sort of chemical. Um, and uh, another one that's kind of similar to that too is uh, um, like tongs that um, are um, dipped with sponges on both sides that you can, instead of having your hands, it's a pair of tongs with sponges and you just dip it and pull up like that too. So. Um, somebody asked about issues. They talked specifically about uh, controlling willows on a pond bank, and I think they were worried about fish kills. But in general, um, just kind of in general, talk about questions about herbicide applications near aquatic areas that may be sensitive. Kind of what do you have to do to address that? Yeah, you want to well, you want to make sure that you're using uh, an aquatic listed uh, uh, an herbicide that is listed for safety near streams or uh, standing bodies of water. Um, there are a few options that you have um, with like a, gly a glyphosate um, aquatic safe, it's called Aquanit. Um, and so just being conscious of, uh, you know, what what the label really says, uh, you know, some some things like uh, are really, really, really dangerous next to water, like triclopyr I know is not really that good to be next to water at all. Um, so. Just making sure that's listed for that use. Okay. Um, you showed a picture for of uh, a weed wrench and you mentioned those. Can you talk a little bit about those, basically what a weed wrench is and kind of what they cost or, or something like that? Yeah, yeah. So there's 
kind of two main brands really there's, there's one called polar bear and one called the weed wrench just that's the brand name and uh they are long um metal um like long metal leverage machines basically with clamps on the front of them that um so you clamp the uh branch or, or, or uh, bottom of the um bush that you're trying to rip out um into the bottom of it and uh, apply pressure from behind and use actual leverage. So the, the length of the pole that you're using actually works in your advantage. So you can really, uh, it's surprising, the, the size of the bush compared to the size of the, the person pulling the bush out is, <laughs> is, is surprising. You know, you can really, really do a lot of work with those. Um, I think I had mentioned too, the only drawback with those is that it's, it, it, if you're working all day with those, you're probably gonna to want to pass it back and forth between someone because they they are just they are kind of bulky. So yeah, two two brands and the pricing, um, gosh, they're over a hundred dollars, I think. Um, I, yeah. Yep. Um, somebody's asking about they need to purchase boots for volunteering and working, and they wanted to know um, rubber boots or what about leather hiking boots? Kind of is. Is it okay to use leather hiking boots when you're doing this kind of work or do you need rubber boots or, or what's your opinion here? Personally, I prefer rubber boots. I've used a leather boots in the past and I mean, leather is absorbent a little bit. So you will end up, um, you know, if you're walking you know, near or uh, around the spot, so you're gonna be spraying, that's gonna end up um, absorbing some of that in there. I, I prefer rubber boots. They're only um, like $15. So if I, if I were uh, with a, a working crew, um, I would ask for their boot sizes and just say, all right, well, we'll, uh, we'll get you all rubber boots instead. So don't end up ru ruining the leather ones. Okay, great. Um, what's your opinion on round uh, versus flat cross section spray tanks? And I think they're talking about slip in spray tanks. You know, those low profile flat ones or the big round ones, oh. are there bonuses or, or positives or negatives about those oh I, lo I love those low profile ones are really nice but uh they're i mean they both they all work they all work really nicely uh low profile I, if you're in really really hairy uh, uh, uh hilly spots um you, you you might have you know a little better control on your front end if it's put a lot of weight on the back um but yeah both you know they'll both do the same thing okay um what about issues if you're spraying something and then you want to mow it following up? So say in a, a, a the, per, the question was about burdock, but it could be about lespides or anything. Um, how long do you have to wait after spraying before you can mow something so you're not messing up with your application? Yeah, so like for lespides, I would, I would say wait for it to, uh, if you're doing like the foliar treatment, uh, wait until you're certain that it's uh, taken and uh, and the plants are kind of starting to really show signs of pulling that chemical uh, underground with them uh, and start to senesce. And then, um, uh, well, also with Lespedeza too, make sure that there's no seed or anything on there. You, you haven't been too late, but um, you know, I, th I think that would be the best bet. Just wait until you know that it's underground and, uh, and the plant's showing signs of decline. Okay. Uh, you did mention uh, thoroughly cleaning tanks and, and your sprayers, um, but we didn't really talk about how. Can you briefly go over the process of how you go about cleaning a tank yeah triple rinse is usually the, the standard uh so um water triple rinse um <clears throat> a lot of times this is best done on site and so for like a landowner um if you're um gonna be you know finishing up the day um fill your tank up a couple times uh rinse it out and then just empty it uh on site where you were just working um spraying it on you know the some invasive plant like a bush or something like that so um yeah and then um the other thing too um with the with the cleaning of the uh, if you're using like bark oil um i've made this mistake before actually and it was not it's not a good one um where you you clean the tank and then it actually has some residual water in there for bark oil applications and ends up kind of turning it milky um, so you really want to make sure that that tank has zero water for those oil um, applications in there after you're done cleaning it. Okay. 
Uh, there was a couple questions asking about that phenology treatment calendar that you um, that you shoot that you showed. Um, where can people get that? Is that available? Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, it's on the River River website, um, and it's under the management of invasive plants. And um, there's a link on the side of on that website. And then also there's a new one too. Um, there's a new management guide um, through. I, is uh, through U of I, I believe, right? Um, yeah, so that same chart has come up um, and um, it's I, and it's curated too. Uh, I mean, I know Chris, you're, cur you're, cur you're curating it over the years too. So it's actually kind of getting tuned in closer and closer to uh, really effective treatments. All righty, good deal. Um, there's a bunch of questions about particular species and how to control them. Uh, there's so many of them. I don't think we have time for that. Um, just because it's like, how do you kill teasel? How do you kill steelgrass? You know, but I would just say that everybody, you can look at these resources that Nick gave you for those specific things. Um, with that, I guess uh, the last question that I do want to address with you basically is this questions about good equipment, um, finding good quality equipment that will last. Is there any advice you have for people for finding um, the right sprayer, um, kind of what do they want to look for to finding good equipment? Yeah, um, so for this presentation, well, okay, so for like locals around here, I would say Rural King does, does have quite a few of these um, pumps and sprayers that I was talking about. They have the chemical safe sprayer, uh, the backpack and the, the slip on units. Um, I don't think they have gas powered. Um, and so outside of um, like local going online, um, I've used forestry suppliers uh, is a really good one. Um, that's where um, I've done a lot of the, uh, that's where I found a lot of the stuff I was talking about today too. So between that and um, forestry suppliers, I think you should be able to find, and if you're really far up North, I think it's farm and fleet also would have that. So 